Jujutsu Kaisen 254 opens up with the one thing that nobody ever thought that would be the final boss fight that Sukuna would have, which is Kusei Kabe versus Sukuna, and even the narrator himself calls it an unthinkable matchup. When we learned that there would be a whole month of prep time before we saw our heroes fight against Sukuna, there were all these dream matchups that were being set up on the off chance that Gojo fell against Sukuna, which obviously he did because Sukuna literally cuts him in half, but each week we saw more people step up and they all got smashed because Sukuna had the mentality of wreck everyone and leave when it comes to our dream matchups and we saw Kashimo he was light work Yujin Higuruma Sukuna had little trouble and ultimately he killed off Higuruma though he did praise him for his growth and he treated Yuji like an afterthought then you got Yuta step up to the plate armed with the domain expansion and Rika's help alongside Yuji and a plan to free Fushiguro and that ultimately led to Maki stepping in because Sukuna basically basically took out Yuta during that battle and left Yuji struggling to repair himself and then he takes down Maki and that ends up with Kusei Kabe going wait what do you mean it's my turn hold on we need a recount yet despite all of this Kusei Kabe he stays strong and he goes right into his simple domain and if nothing else he's managed to get Sukuna's attention and even dare I say it a little bit of respect from Sukuna when Kusei Kabe reacts to his attack in enough time to not be killed and he even gets a smile out of Sukuna when Sukuna realizes he activated his technique without moving a muscle. It's the story once again layering us with that false sense of hope and it serves as a good transition to the flashbacks where we see Mei Mei and she's going yeah Kusei Kabe he's not much anything special. Myself and Nanami we're probably stronger than him. Nanami says hey I can't really see that guy winning a fight but at the same time I can't see him losing a fight either. It's a bunch of backhanded compliments yet the thing about what we're seeing is that both both of them are giving praise to Kusei Kabe at a time where they're having what can be interpreted as being small shallow digs at them and I like it because what we're seeing here is that sometimes what makes you valuable to someone or in the eyes of your superiors isn't necessarily the sexy stuff like how broken your curse technique is because Kusei Kabe doesn't have a curse technique or how crazy strong you are which Kusei Kabe is not crazy strong. There are some things that are just intangible like Nanami saying that Kusei Kabe knows knows how to use different sword styles and knows a lot about jujitsu and has supreme logical analytical skills and barrier technique knowledge. Mei Mei calls him a swift army knife, someone you want to be stuck on an island with. Even Gojo's out here giving him praise and the ever so useless Miwa chimes in by comparing her simple domain against Kusei Kabe's has added commentary to what Gojo's saying about how beginners usually need a binding vow just to use it and that's what makes Kusei Kabe being able to use this domain freely and use it with range is what makes him such an interesting jujitsu sorcerer that you can't really underestimate. Now as a quick side note here the inclusion of Miwa in this is very interesting because if you go back to what we saw in season two of the anime you saw Miwa using that binding vow and she got burned as a result of it. Given that Kusei Kabe is going up against the strongest sorcerer in the history of the jujitsu world and he's a lot stronger than Miwa you think that he would have made a binding vow it might have done some more damage a lot more damage to Sukuna here not necessarily would have defeated him but it would have done a lot of damage but I get why you don't do it if you're him and you don't go into a super extreme like Miwa did because say it doesn't work then you're as good as dead but then again it doesn't matter if it's Sukuna or it's Kenjaku sometimes you gotta YOLO it in order to stay alive because you're dead either way at first glance he's not the first person that you would pick if you lined up all the jujitsu sorcerers that we've met in the series but he is someone who is if you are fortunate enough to have him, he's an unexpected addition to your team because he provides more value than you think, like the money you might find under a pillow cushion that you didn't know that you had. And as the fight progresses, Sukuna himself begins to realize it. And we get additional commentary from Mei Mei, who says that usually the new shadow sword draw is a counter technique, but Kusakabe uses it to bring his opponent towards him by expanding the range of his domain so that he can intercept and counter anyone who invades his domain and moves and we know that Sukuna has to move in order to do just enchantments because he's got to move his mouth and we see it in full display when he starts carving up Sukuna and Nanami starts putting into perspective for us as readers what it is that we're seeing which is that unless you're Gojo then you can't really evade the attacks themselves and as a reader you're watching Kusakabe launch attack after attack and you almost find yourself thinking
thinking, wait a second, is this about to be the biggest troll move ever? Is Kusekabe going to take down Sukuna after he's taken on so many high level sorcerers? Is Kusekabe going to be the one that finishes the story? But then again, as he starts pressuring Sukuna and knocking him around the battlefield, even Kusekabe finds himself wondering why is it that he's trying to fight so hard? And this is where we see another one of the brilliant themes of Jujutsu Kaisen at play, which is where it gets more insight into what Gege is trying to tell us about death. And it's something that I think a lot of the critics of Jujutsu Kaisen don't pay enough attention to. Death is the theme of the series. It's a depressing theme, but it's the theme nonetheless. As humans, we all ask ourselves, what is the meaning to life in one shape, form, or another? We don't really know or understand what we're here for for a good chunk of the time that we're alive. But what we do know is that we run and cling desperately to life. We hold on to it because we don't want to give it up. Death is one of those primal level things that scares us because we don't know what exists after death. Death is an experience that you can just walk up to and ask others about barring whatever religious belief you have, but taking out the whole concept of faith itself. You can't really go up to someone and say, hey man, what's it like to die? What happens when you die? It's not like if you want to know what the food tastes like at a new restaurant and you can just ask somebody who walks out of it or you can go read reviews online. Well, with Kusei Kabe, when he's asking himself about his reason for trying so hard, the reason it links back to death is that he's thinking about Principal Yaga and the fact that he owes him and that's how we get to the concept of death itself. When you lose someone you care about or you know well, the worst thing you can do is continue to mourn them. Long Long after they're gone or waste the life that's left behind that they can no longer live or walk beside you on your travel. It's incumbent upon you to make the most out of everything, regardless as to how crappy the situation is. And that's what Kusekabe is doing right here. He's putting in the effort against Sukuna, even though he knows it's a losing effort. In his heart of hearts, Kusekabe knows he is dead. Kusekabe might complain a lot, but at his core, he knows there are times where a bill has to be paid. No matter how much it hurts to pay it, or how much you don't want to pay it, you have to do it. And that's what Gojo and Nanami and Mei Mei are each pretty much trying to say. He's a kind guy. He is a man guy. In short, he's a man's man. And that leads to him sucking it up, knowing that as a grown man, he can't hide with his tail between his legs because he just watched children in Yuji and Maki and Yuta. They all put their lives on the line to try to bring down Sukuna. So the least he can do is honor their failures in battle by trying to bring home the battle itself and he goes right for Sukuna's damaged heart. And it shows off what we're told earlier in the chapter. Kusakabe is perceptive, it's analytical, and he's logical. It's the one move you don't hesitate to make in this situation, but the problem is, is that Sukuna reads the move itself, and Sukuna hits him with the counter, and unfortunately for Kusakabe, that counter leaves him being carved up like a turkey on Thanksgiving and leaking fluids like an OnlyFans model. It's then that we see Mei Mei's brother teleport onto the scene, and Sukuna pops up out the shadows behind him, ready to strike him down and this is something that we all knew at some point was coming. Sukuna was shown a few chapters ago realizing what it was that Mei Mei's brother was doing and he came up with the possibility that he was teleporting people to Shoko to have her use reverse curse technique on people to save them and Sukuna basically is about to cancel Christmas on him but before he can at least another surprise combatant stepping into the arena. Miguel has returned to Japan and is ready to battle Sukuna. Now this is very interesting because if you've read Jujutsu Kaisen Volume 0 or you saw the Jujutsu Kaisen movie, you know this dude, he isn't weak. However, he is also a Gojo victim. Gojo in the movie hit Miguel with a series of combos and he had him running so hard that the ancestors, they were cursing Gojo from the grave and every person of color who saw that scene was probably thinking, they can't explain how, but Gojo hitting Miguel with that many hits, it had to be racist in some kind of way. Now jokes aside, I bring that up to say this, the narrator calls Miguel someone who went toe to toe with Satoru Gojo and because Miguel became a meme after that combo attack was animated it can be easy to overlook Miguel is a fighter but I think we need to take the extra information that we have here given about Gojo's punches to realize there's actually information to upscale Miguel now that we have the narrator saying what they're saying we had Hikari and Yuta both saying that when Gojo punches you on top of it being a boost in power to a normal punch it also feels like you're getting hit with a counter punch and and you had Hikari and Yuta basically saying that when Gojo punched them, it was hard enough that they vomited. Miguel, on the other hand, he ate several of those punches. 
this is another sign that Jujutsu Kaisen is reaching its end because we're seeing guys like Miguel show back up and if he's got a piece of the reverse horn or heaven left that's really the only thing that he's got going for him unless there's some crazy upscaling which I think might be the case but we'll have to see in a moment with the next chapter but in the meantime click here to watch my every domain expansion video.